Well, Leslie, while I have you. Yeah. Um, uh, the players um, have plans for an April fundraiser. So maybe, I don't know how locked in you are to thinking of April. The variety show that we were going to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does it matter? I mean, it's a different kind of thing. Um, I don't know. People can respond to that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see i don't think it matters because it is a very different kind of thing but i think the committee could weigh in they're too busy in march i was just trying to i mean may i mean yeah i mean may is okay but it seemed like a good winter activity um i my thought was that if people are being asked to donate money to this cause, oh, to, to, I no, don't yeah. want to be asked too often. <laughs> yeah. Well, but this is um, this is an activity. We're we're going to get into the topic in just a minute. So, uh, looks like you've got a question, Robert, or a point to make. Yeah, just uh, I'm I'm a little confused about the. the uh, the, our open meeting law requirement are we supposed to be in a place that's that has allows public in and you know details like that anyone can answer me the requirements pat or uh, or sandy no there was a short period of time where the the law had the exemption to that what you're speaking of had ex expired but legislature jumped in and extended it until June of 2024. So we can still, we can still have meetings. Yeah, we're okay on Zoom as long as it's open to public. Um, it is. That's my understanding. Right. How about posting? Don't we have to post some? It was, it's posted to the post office, skip mark and town office Bolton board on Monday. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to check. No, it's perfectly fine. And you know, we'll be doing more of these. Well, let's go ahead and get started. It's a few minutes after our start time. I know a few people expect to be here, but a bit late. Um want to welcome Kirk White. Good to see you. And thanks for coming tonight. And uh, Orca Media is with us tonight as well. So this will be recorded for uh, posterity, I guess. And uh, you know anyone else who wants to check in and see you know what we're what we're doing. So we'll go ahead and get started. And I'll I'll moderate the meeting. The agenda was sent out in advance, and uh, the first item on the agenda is uh, to update folks on where we are with uh, fundraising for the high school heat. And I know that uh, Midge and Sue and Leslie particularly have been working on. Uh, some approaches, and I don't see Midge here yet, so maybe we could go ahead with Sue and Leslie, and then we'll catch up Midge if, he jo if she joins us a little bit later on. Um, yeah, the 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 players. I, I I guess I should have confirmed with Midge about our April planning because we're already planning. We got a team, and we um, because it's a variety show, we have to have tryouts and that. It's going to happen soon, so word has to go out soon. Um, but we're planning a variety show that would be um, the working title is "Turn Up the Heat," and it's a benefit variety show for the community. Um, there'll be tryouts on um, March 18th at the high school auditorium. We have uh, the okay to use the auditorium. Um, and uh, the show on April 15th. So um, right now we're getting ready to send out um, information about the tryouts and it will be, the tryouts will be um, a screening to get a good balance of, of the show. It's not, it's not a, um, there's no winners or losers. Um, we, we might accept everybody that comes because that might be just the right number, <laughs> so. But it's not, uh, it's different from the uh, talent, what is it, who's got talent or, yeah, that they've done in the past in, in town. 
Um, Valley Idol. Valley Idol. Idol, right, <laughs> right. Um, and it, people can come with uh, singing or instrumental or dance or skits, comedy, even acrobats, whatever. We would like to get lots of variety. And um, there'll be a charge at the door and uh, we hope to make some money. I just Perfect. want to ask a, a correction. You said benefit the community, but. The yeah, oh, it'll in the, in the, um, the broad in, on the flyer, it's going to say what the, what the purpose is. Yeah, that it's for the repurposing, for the heat. keeping the, keeping the heat going. Yeah. Leslie. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. I look forward to it. Yeah, you you could come and play piano. <laughs> <laughs> so you want? Are you asking me for my idea, Vic? Yes, please. Okay. So um, I had this idea of uh, a Vegas night. I went to a party like this. So the the company comes in with the tables, the craps table, the roulette, um, blackjack tables. Um, this group is located in Waitsfield. They're very successful and they've done a lot of school fundraisers in Vermont that are successful. We're a small town. Um, so it's a $1,200 fixed fee that covers two employees to run roulette and craps. And then we would have to get volunteers to, that they would train for blackjack tables. They suggest six to eight tables. And um, so we, if we were going to do this, we would figure out what we want our admission to be and what that gives them. Does that give them $125 of chips? Um, and then if they want to buy more chips, um, do, do we give them, you know, $150 for $10, $20? Do we give them $300 in chips? What, what do you, you know, that's, that's their, they've worked with these numbers before. Those are just ideas. You can change it. Um, or make it up how you like. Um, and then you don't cash in your chips, your chips get cashed in for raffles. So we would have to secure items from businesses and people and artists maybe for some raffle items. And that's where um, they can cash in and win. So that this is an idea. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know um, any other communities in uh, central Vermont who've done this and yeah, they do it in Waitsfield. There's a lot of schools in Vermont that that use this company. Yeah. Okay. So they have a track record. Good. Pat. Yeah. Pat. I just I just called Midge. She thought the meeting was tomorrow night, so she's getting on now. So okay, I'll, I'll just quickly on. I'll just quickly review that the fundraising wait, efforts wait. that started. Wait, Catherine, wait. before you Pat had her hand up, she had and oh sorry. Leslie's talking. Go ahead, Pat. Um, you would have this at Pierce Hall? Yeah. Mm hmm Yes. Okay. And is there an idea of uh, what would be expected as a, a final profit? Did they give you any idea? No. No, because we, we'd have to you know we'd have to figure out you know i mean i i did some numbers if you if you had 30 people we would certainly get more than 30 people at 30 a piece that's 900 dollars let's say 10 people buy 25 more of chips that gives us 1350 so i think you're talking a few thousand at least okay good if we can if we can if we can cover the 1200 dollar table uh, cost the initial cost with with spawn they they suggest you get businesses to sponsor a table or individuals to sponsor a table and that covers your twelve hundred dollars now you know they work in bigger towns what she said she kept saying call casella you know i said i don't think they work in our town we're pretty tiny so we can go afield and seek some donations sponsors very good all right hello midge Hi, sorry. I thought the meeting was tomorrow night. So, okay. uh, Sue, Sue has already spoken of the variety show, and Leslie just spoke of the uh, casino uh, Vegas night. And uh, was there a third fundraising item that you were going to speak to? I don't yeah, know. yeah. Um, there is. Um, just a minute, please. 
Hey, Dane, no. can you not do that for a minute? Because I'm having trouble hearing, okay? Thank you. And, and um, just keep it, keep it brief. No need for long, long explanation. Yeah, so what I was thinking of doing was an art project that would involve the community, including the, um, the elementary kids, where there is um, barn, um, barn quilts and mandalas, squares and circles. Um, they would be a project that would vary for, in sizes. People would have choices to do either or um, and, um, and a choice of sizes as well. It would be an ongoing project um, that would last a couple of months, give people time to be creative. And then there would be a show of all the different pieces, uh, a gallery show. And then my thought was to auction them off um, at with the silent auction on 4th of July um, at, on the park and uh, after the parade, giving people a little bit of a chance to view them. Um, so the, the barn quilts are traditional New England um, decoration that usually traditionally are four by four. Um, they get painted in the style of a quilt um, and but they're all painted and um, and then the mandalas are in circular shape and they're a repeated repetitive design that um, um, usually incorporates things of nature and whatnot in them. These would could vary in size from four by four, two by two or one by one um, treated so they can be um, hung outside and on a, on a building or on a porch. And the mandalas could be anywhere from a four foot circle down to a one foot circle. Um, Again, it would be somebody else's, some uh, the artist's choice, and I, um, and so I thought the kids could get involved with that as well. Um, maybe uh, can work with the art teacher and have her help, kind of um, instruct the kids how to how to go about this. But the artists themselves would foot the um, the tab for the. Um, supplies for the supplies and it would be their choice on how they would like to do it and so even though um you know traditionally they are used for mounting outside on buildings um if somebody really feels inclined to do something that's a little bit more delicate or with fabric or dried flowers or whatever um you know they should have that option too i really want people to be creative with these as much as they can but then the goal would be, as I said, to display them um, and then to have a silent auction at a time where there's as many people as we can possibly get. Um, and 4th of July seems to be a good thing. And a lot yeah. of times after the, the barbecue in the parade, people are just kind of milling around wanting something to do. So I thought mm -hmm. that might be a good time to do that. Yeah. And. Yeah. Um, nice have our thing. captured audience. Yeah, nice addition to the festivities too. Yeah. Good. So that's right. it. Great, thank you. Sounds good. All right, I'm going to move on to the next item, which is the Brownfields and Hazmat update. I'm going to uh, take the lead on reporting on a meeting that um, Catherine and I had. And, and uh, Pat, you weren't with us when uh, with uh, Sarah Wright talked about hazmats and. Brownfield, I don't think we've been in so many meetings together. I'm not sure which one you, <laughs> you were in, <laughs> but if I it sounds that, familiar. That was in the February 3rd meeting, I believe, but there were two meetings. First one was January 31st. Not sure, Pat, were you on that one too? Just listening to yep. a little bit of a meeting about the <laughs> high school meeting. So you can watch whatever you want. Who's talking? Uh, I think it was Burma. I just muted her. 
<laughs> Sorry, Burma. <laughs> Sorry, Burma. <laughs> little background stuff. Anyway, so uh, uh, back on the 31st, uh, there was a meeting with uh, Sarah Wright from Two Rivers uh, where we got a little more background on the whole Brownfields uh, assessment process. Uh, and just to sort of recap, there's a, there's a difference between brownfield. Brownfields is the, the physical fields outside the building, basically. What's in the ground? Um, and is there anything dangerous in the ground that needs to be removed? And then the hazmat speaks to materials that are inside the building itself. And so we have some reporting back on uh, what's called phase one of the brownfields assessment. And um, so, uh, what was recognized was from a research of the documents and the history of that site, uh, it was learned that not only was there a high school, but well before the high school, there was a wood products factory there and a railroad siding. And so what those uh, kinds of activities tend to do is produce uh, hydrocarbons that leach into the soil. Um, we don't know to what extent yet that's a later phase to figure out quantitatively and qualitatively what's there and how much is there. Uh, but also it can be uh, pesticides that are used to keep the grass down around the uh, railroad tracks, uh, fuels for the machinery that ran the, the, the uh, uh, wood products mill. So all that is potential and yet to be discovered in terms of, again, quantitatively and qualitatively what's there and if it, whether or not it's, it's to the extent that it has to be removed and mitigated. Um, I just can also, I just open a, a, a Vic? Can sure. I just say this Please. is phase one of the NEPA for those who need a little bit of reminding the National Environmental Protection Act, which is a requirement to undergo the environmental assessment uh, if you're going to be eligible for most federal funding. So the phase one is phase one of the NEPA, which yeah. is a doc, principally a document review. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get to talking about phase two in a bit, uh, but as Catherine said, we're talking about phase one. So there's, there's those risks. There's also risk of an underground plume of hydrocarbon from what used to be the uh, Rochester Tire and Auto store, and I guess it was a gas station before then. Uh, and because the property around the school is downstream, downfield from that location, it's possible that there's, uh, as I say, a plume of hydrocarbons occurring underneath the ground. And, and that might or might not have to be mitigated. It depends on what's the concentration and, and if it's there at all. So it's it's a risk factor. And that's what phase one of, is about, is identifying risk factors. Did she say the Rochester Tire? I thought she said the Irving gas station, which would be the skip mark. It says old gas station. Irving's not an old gas station. It's an existing gas station. It, it used to be the gas station. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. So it, the it, Rochester Tire and Auto was in Irving because the only Irving gas station. No, 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 station... no, no, no. Rochester Tire and Auto was a former gas station before it's just Tire and Auto, I believe. Yeah, Stan Care switched them around. Yeah, and, the, and the, the term that she used was the old gas station. That's what I took it to mean, not the current yeah. gas station. Okay. Yes, I, I do know that. And I do know that's an identified brownfield situation that is going through some sort of remit, uh, mitigation process. Right. Yeah. So the, the next step on that is to actually dig holes and do sampling underground, see what's actually there. Uh, that's, a, that's a whole process. And first they have to develop a plan for how they're going to go about it. And then there has to be the actual physical uh, sampling and then the analysis of the sampling and then, uh, you know, to the extent uh, mitigation is required and that would be a later step. And all that, you're talking months and months of uh, work in the future and also finding the funding for that to, to take place. There are, there are funds around, uh, there's a process for finding it and we learned a little bit about that today, some of the agencies go and talk to. Um, the um, so I lost my train of thought. Uh, so, hazardous material. Yes. Yeah, so let me go on to hazardous material. So there, uh, there was a physical examination uh, within the high school building looking for four uh, types of contaminants specifically, and I'll I'll go from uh, one to the other. So the first one was they looked for lead, 
uh, lead paint, um, and there's a there's an X-ray based machine that's used. And they just scan the walls and floors and doors and and look. Then they can identify lead. And and <laughs> to our great uh, satisfaction, they only they found a very small extent of lead. It was on two doors uh, in the multi-purpose room area, and, mm -hmm. and those can be mitigated by basically removing the doors. Uh, so uh, that was. That was a good one uh, to learn about. Um, it has to be done by- on the, doors, on the doors and not on the on the casings, only the doors on room nine and 25. The mitigation itself has to be done by a certified contractor who knows how to handle this, can you know, withdraw it properly and, and uh, dispose of it properly. So that's, that's that one. Um, next one we looked at was, <clears throat> they looked at was PCBs. Uh, PCBs, uh, it's been much in the news. Uh, it can off gas from building materials that are, um, uh, you know, even uh, out of sight of uh, where you are in the building. It can come from lots of different places. The issue here is what's the level of uh, concern, you know, the concentration that is a level of concern. And um, it seems um, that the um, the levels, it depends on the use of the building. So for example, uh, it, uh, ironically enough, daycare is not specifically regulated, but it's obviously something that you'd want to have a pretty low level of concentration, if any at all. Um, the level, uh, the, uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, I'll jump so, into it. it uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation is not going to require us to take action, which is a very interesting uh, piece of it, too. Yeah. yeah. And that's who we're working with. Yeah, so that one's still sort of up in the air. We're not sure exactly how um, that's going to be resolved, but uh, 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 there is PCB present, but... Uh, you know, the extent to which it is a concern is, is yet to be resolved. So that one needs further work. And, it, and, and Jamie Canarney, the superintendent said that um, the, the high school is scheduled for PCB air testing. So the places that she pointed out were the adhesive on the cinder blocks, the windows and the doors and the ballast. Mm -hmm. Right, the ballast are the uh, components of the fluorescent lighting system. Uh, next one that uh, I started looking into is asbestos. And uh, you may recall from the 2019 Black River study, there was asbestos was found. Uh, the, this time around, a brief uh, visual inspection was done. Uh, they uh, identified some things, uh, uh, certain ceiling tiles. Um, and uh, Jamie said that uh, uh, they just completed some asbestos testing in the high school in 2021. He has a report on that that uh, specifies what's been found and where. And uh, I haven't seen that report personally. I don't know if you've seen it, Catherine, but uh, he was going to send uh, it. No, he, when Sarah. we spoke to him last, he hadn't quite uh, gotten together to send that over, but he's going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and he thinks there's no asbestos in the uh, ceiling tiles, only in the boiler room. Mm -hmm. So. The problem, I think, was the contractor who did it didn't contact, didn't work bring the results to VHB or work within the state somehow. I, I can't remember. My notes are poorly written in terms of my handwriting, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, that that we'll, we'll have more information on that because we've not gotten a copy of the 2021 report. Right. And the fourth item that was looked into was mold. Uh, mold is a, is a real concern. Um, particularly for vulnerable populations. Um, and there is concern about mold in the building. However, uh, it is being, Jamie reported that it is being addressed by the consultant working with, uh, with the school as a result of the water main break, because with the water that spilled, not water main, but the uh, fire alarm uh, sprinkler system. When the sprinkler system broke, it spilled water, which promoted mold growth, and they have uh, mold remediation as part of the uh, repair of that work. Um, in any place where water has come in, like through the leaky roof, uh, there's there's apt to be mold. So 
that has to be uh, addressed. It's something that's not just a matter of scrubbing off the walls, but uh, takes more vigorous work. If it gets into concrete, you have to sandblast the concrete surface off to get at the, the mold and concrete. So, so that, Doug, can I just want to jump in there because the contractor was in at the end of October and he did not make us wait about the mold. He contacted within 24 hours the school system because uh, of where it was found was basically, he thought the cause of an insufficiently heated east wing. And so the school jumped on that immediately, uh, uh, you know, in response to his urgings, because he said, if they didn't, it would get deeper into the building. So. So those are, those are preliminary findings. There's additional work that needs to be done uh, to, uh, you know, assess how, you know, much of a concern, particularly PCB and, and mold is, and get that taken care of, uh, but it's well underway. Catherine, anything to add? No, I just jumped in as I, I felt I like should. As, that was right, good, me, thanks. Sure, let me yeah. pause for questions, feedback from the group on, uh, on the hazmat or the brownfields for that matter. Okay. Um, and just to further follow up on the on the brownfields front, uh, uh, Pat and Catherine and Sarah Wright and I met today uh, with people from the state who will work with us and work with the town on the umbrella application. Uh, we had a pre-application meeting today. This is the process that will enable the town uh, as a prospective. Uh, buyer of the piece of property to be protected by the umbrella uh, 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 protections against the liability for any future claims of, of uh, responsibility for cleaning up the site uh, once this process is through and, and you get a certificate of completion. And that, and that certificate of completion can be passed on to um, a subsequent sell, uh, buyer of the building from the town if and when that takes place. So it's something that goes with the property like a deed, which is very good to hear. All right, uh, next item is floodway and floodplain. And I know Dick and Dorothy were planning to uh, join us tonight, but uh, we're gonna be delayed. So maybe we'll come back to that. Well, I can, I can start on that, you know. Okay if you want, um, because sure. I was at that meeting. Yep. So on, um, so if Dick are here, I think he would uh, say that um, the, we've gone, we've moved ahead with the steps to remove the flood way, uh, the, the part of the high school parcel that still existed in the uh, flood way. And uh, Dubois King uh, did the survey uh, that's been complete. We're waiting to get the map, uh, but uh, we did get the bill, and I did forward that on to Julie today. Uh, so we feel that we're moving quite along with that. However, when we met with John Brooker Campbell, who is the floodplain manager for this region on Friday morning, um, he basically said uh, that uh, we need to go a little bit further because there's a possibility that we'll have some Act 250 uh, um, compliance that we have to deal with. And uh, that was a surprise to us because Sandy Haas had stated at our feasibility study public meeting that due to the size of the parcel, we would Act 250 things would be waived. Uh, so that was a little bit of a surprise. Um, anyway, uh, I'm gonna just, I just opened my notes from that meeting and let me see. Oh, here's the next caveat on that. Dick stated that there, uh, that uh, we have to get a water permit uh, for this change of the property and that there are exemptions from the need for a permit, permit but we do not fall under that exemption. Um, that less than 2% of the area is being transferred. So Dick then asked Jamie Canarney if the school district would, would contact the regional engineer to see if there is a waiver if, 
if both properties are under the same ownership. So we're waiting for Jamie to get back uh, to us. And John said, John Brooker Campbell, the floodplain manager said, or he advised that we get a jurisdictional opinion regarding the Act 250 compliance. He said, Sandy may be 100% right, but we don't wanna go down the road uh, and find out at a more inconvenient time that we have to come into compliance with Act 250. So he gave us a couple of names that we will pursue that with him. Um, so what else? Um, we reviewed Gre Greg Gosson's uh, suggestions. He's our uh, consultant architect uh, for eliminating the floodplain. This is where the high school building took in water during Irene in the lower part of the auditorium. And I, I think all of these, uh, these suggestions have been shared, so I'm not gonna necessarily uh, go through them all, but they sort of honed in on two, which was to either eliminate the door from the auditorium that has a sill below the mean flood elevation, and then what they call drive proof the exterior walls that are below the mean flood elevation, and that we could possibly be looking at a floodgate solution uh, for the door, uh, and that uh, Greg has experience with this, and D and K would have an engineer that would work with Greg to sign off on anything. Um, so before you know, before we actually even hone in what's the possible. We are trying to organize a follow-up meeting at the high school with a DNK engineer, with the uh, consultant architect, with uh, Grace Vinson, the uh, environmental uh, state officer, who's the one who pointed out to us, you know, that the property was in both the floodway and the floodplain, and uh, and John John Brooker Campbell, who agreed to come back. So uh, it was a very positive meeting. He liked he liked our uh, proposal very much. Uh, Patty asked about the possibility uh, of splitting the building into two separate buildings uh, because the eastern part of the building is not uh, located in the floodplain, and he was not on board with that. He said that the building was too close to the to the to the river corridor for it to be an appropriate housing site. Um, he said neither would he approve a solar array uh, on any of the land behind the high school because uh, whoever the installer would be, and let's just say for instance, Green Mountain Power, because they've actually suggested this, they would bring in gravel to, to uh, insulate their installation, he said, and given the possibility of a flood, that gravel would all wash into the waterway. So he said he, he would never approve a solar array, but it was okay to put it on the roof, which is something we've talked about. Um, he said because the uh, upgrade is projected at a cost of 3.1 million, um, that would be considered a substantial. So the entire building would have to be brought into compliance. So we asked, well, the compliance with what entity? And basically with the Rochester Flood Hazard Plan regulations. So, and the head and the one who is uh, sort of wearing that hat is Dune. So Patty called Dune while we were all in the meeting and Dune talked with John, they happen to know each other, and um, Dune understands that the flow of the whole process will go first through Rochester and then to him. So that's about it. We, you know, as I said, uh, John's gonna be contacting Grace. We're gonna schedule a follow-up on-site meeting. Uh, we're waiting for Jamie and Dick to have a conversation about the jurisdictional of, of, of opinion of Act 250 because we're not sure whether that should be the property owner or the prospective buyer. We just don't know. And that's all. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Any questions, Catherine or me on those issues before we move on? Thank you. Thank you for getting all that information and sticking with it. That's <laughs> <laughs> It's our new hobby. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, okay, next item, town vote date discussion. So um, we wanna have a, a true conversation discussion here around this question of when should we uh, go to the town for a vote on acquisition of the property or not? You know, 
initially we thought it would be uh, in March this next month. And then as we got into the realities of the hazmat and uh, Brownfield's assessment, realized that we're not gonna have nearly the kind of information we need to be able to provide to people until late the summer at, at best. So I kind of put it off to there. But on the flip side, there's, there's money out there to be, to be applied for, uh, for grants to fix this building. And you know, we're a little concerned about waiting that long uh, before even starting the application process, assuming that the town agrees to take the building. So um, we just want to just open up for conversation what people think about what's, what is good timing, what feels right, what does not feel right, what are other issues that people may have in mind that should be taken into consideration so that we can target towards a point in time um, and be and be building towards that um, over the next uh, period of months or whatever. Here's Dick. Hello, Dick. Hey, Dick, can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. Um, I think we've covered the floodway and floodplain issues adequately. To save you the <laughs> trouble unless you really want to talk about it. <laughs> Catherine, good. And, uh, I guess Leslie, the one question Leslie. to have, Dick is whether Jamie was ever got back to him about the water permit and was there any decision about who uh, would be pursuing uh, the the Act 250 question, whether that's the property owner or us, that that was still up in the air. Right. I, I haven't heard back from Jamie about uh, the wastewater permit yet. And um, do we have a strategy about the uh, jurisdictional opinion? Well, I, my, my, I, my question is, who is the appropriate person to pursue that with the two contacts that he gave us? If it is the school district, I think anybody would be willing to support Jamie on a phone call because I don't think Jamie is going to be 100% confident about presenting this particular project, even though he's superintendent and the school uh, owns the building. So I think that in the end, it will be a group uh, effort. So Sandy, I have a question here. Away oh. Go ahead, Sandy. Yes. Well, are we talking about whether an active 50 permit is required for the subject for the little little boundary adjustment, or are we talking about the big project? Big project. Okay. So if that's us. That's not the school. Um, and and that's, that's that's something that you that's something you'd be willing to. Uh, go forward with? Um, I will work with others. I don't have the, I don't have the factual, all the factual um, uh, information that you do. But well, let me, I'll, let me start with a, with a straightforward phone call because I, I didn't, I thought that everything under 10, under 10 acres was just NA. So I'm not quite sure what he's, what he's working on. So let me start with that. And I will, who do I get back to? Catherine, Vic, what do you, do you want? Yeah, you can get back you, back to me. Vic was was uh, in Montana during that meeting, so uh, I can certainly get back to you. Uh, or Dick, Dick was in the meeting too. So was Patty, uh, and uh, and I can also give you the contact of John so that you can get further clarification about what it is that he was talking about. Because he said you may be a hundred percent right, but he still wanted us to go uh, pursue this jurisdictional opinion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Get me his, get me, uh, send me an email with his contact information and I'll follow up. Okay. Good. Yeah. I, I think what we need is a sort of a pre-jurisdictional <laughs> opinion just to, to, to find out if they want to hear from us and, and, yeah. and what information they need. They do jur jurisdictional letters all the time. That's yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sandy. Thank, thank you, Sandy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello, Dorothy. I see you're there too. Hi. Welcome. Uh, so we were just beginning to have a conversation around number four, the town vote date. 
Um, and it, I was saying that um, on the one hand, you know, we we have this um, hazmat and brownfields timeline that we're working on to get uh, information for us, for the whole town, for that matter, in terms of what the actual condition of the property is. Um, and that's going to take a number of months. It will take us easily into the end of summer. We wanted to go that far before having uh, the vote and, and making an informed vote. On the other hand, what Catherine and I are, are hearing from various sources is that there's a lot of money out there to be had. And you know, the sooner you go for it as the owner, uh, the better. Um, so we just want to get a sense, and Catherine, you can elaborate on that because you've had more of the direct contact with that information. Um, of what are people feeling in terms of when we ought to be targeting uh, this town vote and what kinds of information uh, or, or uh, milestones should take place before then and, and how we might ramp up and prepare for that. So this is, this is a conversation and trying to get sort of a sense of the group of when we should do this. So there, so there is a, uh, a consortium of representatives uh, from various organizations, funding sources within the state that realize that all of the ARPA money and other kinds of uh, what they're calling one-time funding uh, is quickly being obligated to larger population density areas. And so now they're making a real push to make presentations in the more rural areas of Vermont to, and they bring in a head of multi, a representative from every, from, from a lot of agencies. Uh, and there was, I, I watched the video of the presentation in Orange County that happened on January 23rd. And, and when, when it was all said and done, I asked, you know, in the process of um, our project, as the potential buyer, can we go ahead and apply for these funds? Because a lot of them, uh, they don't even expect the implementation until, you know, two years down the road, but the obligation of the funds or the granting of the funds is happening sooner than later. And they were stressing time and time again, do not wait, do not wait, do not wait. So we're not, we're not the, the owner. And the school district isn't a, an eligible candidate to apply, and neither is a nonprofit. It's got to be, uh, it's got to be a municipality. So that's why Vic and I were kicking this around. It's like, well, you know, I think the town, at least at the time of the uh, uh, of the annual meeting, needs to know that, as we had said at our select board meeting and at school board meetings and public meetings. Um, Sarah Wright gave us uh, the timeline most recently, and it's not going to be until August that she says we're going to get the results of the whole environmental process. Because even though phase one is done and those, those reports are in, the next step is to make a work plan, and that doesn't happen overnight. And then the next step is the phase two sampling and testing. And she, she basically said it's not going to be until the end of August that we have the information that we have always felt was so important to the voters of Rochester. But maybe the voters of Rochester will, will take the attitude that, well, uh, we're, we're, getting, we're enrolling in the umbrella, which means that we're, we'll be protected from uh, future liability of anything that could occur with the uh, hazardous uh, materials or brownfields with respect to the, um, the project. Uh, but we do need to get we need to get that 3.1 million started. You know, we'll apply for another earmark, uh, and we'll you know we certainly are, feel that we will be a good position to make uh, an application for an implement implementation grant from the Vermont um, Community Development uh, Program. But do we? Does the town want to vote sooner? Do they want to wait till? The, uh, till August, or do they want to make a vote sooner? Or, you know, should the voters be weighing in about the whole process at this point? Because the select board's been very clear, they want to leave this up to the voters. Anybody have an opinion or question? Leslie. I, I don't think you can ask them to vote unless you have a, a public meeting and talk to them about. Of course, of, we're not taking yeah, a vote. Think, we're not 
vote at town meeting. No, no, no. no. I know I'm we're not voting at town meeting, but but at some point you have you have to have another public <clears throat> bring yeah, the people in, bring the people yeah. in. And, we're, we're, and I don't know that anybody ever just talks about this is an asset. Do you just throw an asset away? Exactly. Yeah, we're, we're, we're assuming that that there will be a communication education process. We're really only looking at the, the date as the issue or relative date. Yeah, <clears throat> that's all. And I do, and we are, they are going to be uh, holding a second uh, meeting or they're going to have uh, probably several, but they're going to have one in Windsor, but they're going to have it in our area of Windsor. As a matter of fact, the reason that we even first got wind of this is that um, Erica Hoffman Kais from the uh, Green Mountain Economic Development Board gave us an email thinking um, that the first January 23rd presentation could happen in the high school. And so, you know, Lindy and Julie really went to work to make it all possible. And then it was like, uh oh, you guys are in Windsor and not in Orange looks like it can't be there, but I'm thinking she wants it to happen at our high school when they do the Windsor presentation. I don't know, you know, I'm not the one who's deciding this, but uh, certainly um, the school board uh, and, and, and Lindy uh, was very open for them to meet here. And, and when that happens, which is gonna be soon, uh, whether it's here or another part in Windsor, uh, I think we all need, those of us who are truly interested in this, need to show up at the meeting because uh, it's important to really hear the whole conversation and and what's due when in terms of grants and what are the criteria and what are the amounts because this is the way the funding stack is created. You leverage multiple grants to get to where you need to get to. Good. Um, my thought is because this is such a long haul project and requiring so many, as Catherine says, so many different grants along the way, um, I think the sooner we know how the town feels about whether or not they want to take on the building, the, the better, because it would really dictate um, where we go with all this. And, um, you know, with all the having a, a number of informational meetings and um, in person, online, uh, however we can manage it, um, you know, letting people know as much as we know at this point in time and what we gain and to have the vote early and what we gain or what we lose by not applying for these grants now. Um, it's a non-starter if we don't get some of this money and if we're letting it kind of go to the wayside because we don't have the consensus of the town. Um, that's money that probably won't come back in the pipeline for quite a while. So um, I think the sooner we can get the meetings, the informative meetings going and get some consensus from the town, um, I mean, we should really know. I mean, it's been three years since the group has been working on all of this and where does the town really stand on it? We, we don't know. So that's and, my- and it, well, it was told to us early on that in terms of being eligible for the federal money, we have to complete phase one of the NEPA. We don't have to complete phase two. We could go through phase one and phase two and the town based on the results of that can still say, no, we don't want to buy. There's no obligation for the town to purchase having gone through one and two of the NEPA. Dick? Um, this, this is probably uh, useless, but uh, the, this, is, uh, this is ultimately a problem of the citizens of Rochester one way or the other. And um, I'm wondering if the select board should be approached once again, explaining the present situation and how their unwillingness to take on the building is adding years, not months, but years to the process. And that 
that whether the town votes to take it on or not, it's still the town's responsibility. So other than politically, <laughs> what's the downside? Pat, do you want to speak to that or? I can, only, I can only lend my own, my own feelings. I, I can't speak for the entire select board because we need to have facts and numbers in front of us. What we went through tonight, um, you have a, a roadmap of what needs to be done. My other column to the right was how much does all this cost? And there was no mention of any numbers. We need to present to the town numbers, a uh, timeline, and who is going to be funding it. We've got to have something that's a little more solid than here is what we've got to do and we'll figure it out when we'll get grant money and figure it out later. We've got to have a solid. Um, I, we, we, I agree we have to have something more solid than what we have right now, even the even how the full assessment process is going to be paid for. We've been told there's plenty of money in DEC, but I didn't hear uh, any either of those two representatives say that to us tonight. Did you, Patty? No, no. And what we're facing again is um, for some reason Stockbridge, um, their CLA um, factor that is part of their education budget from the state, their CLA went down to 75%, even though they did a reappraisal of their value, town values only two years ago. Um, I'm not sure why I feel something is awry there because Rochester only went down to 87%. Why would Stockbridge go down to 75 in just two years? I have property in Stockbridge too. So I'm not looking for this 14% increase in my taxes either. Um, so they're, they're, they're up in arms over a 14% increase in their just their education part of their tax rate. And um, they're looking towards the school system to number one, the first thing on their list is to eliminate heating the, the school next winter. Um, they're gonna line item that right out of there. Um, and um, they're, they, so they're pointing- That's not completely accurate, Patty. They're not gonna line item it right out of there. They wanna keep doing this one third, one third, one third that we did this year, which is a reversal to what they said. And the, the high school heat has nothing to do with the tax rate going up for we Stockbridge. Know, but they, it's become a symbol. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but nonetheless, this is how the, this is how Jamie's expecting them to react. Um, so, I mean, they've got to, if they can't change the CLA, they got to look elsewhere to bring down their tax rate. So um, that's one place they're going to look right away. Jamie Canari is looking towards getting a decision on the school one way or another, positive or negatives. That way he knows what his future with that building will be. Um, so I can agree that Jamie's looking for a decision, the sooner the better. The town here is, is not ready to present to the taxpayers, the voters, um, based on what we have in front of us. Um, and again, you know, the more we think we've cleared a couple hurdles, we find that there's a couple more behind it. So, you know, I'm certainly not thinking that we can go for any vote before August. Probably not. The one thing too that we don't really know of, which we hope to get really soon, is the cost of the floodplain mitigation. Not the floodway, the floodplain. So um, that has become a priority. It's one that Liz Curry uh, pressed and we're pursuing it. And so the cost of that is still up in the air and whether or not the, high, the, the school district could actually put some of their $65,000 building <clears throat> reserve fund towards that. I wanna I want to throw out one more variable in this that 
We've only touched on a few times in the past and one which Peter Fairweather thought was critically important for us to consider. And that is who really ought to be the long-term owner of this building? Let's say if the town takes it, are we talking about the town holding it until for a year or you know, so until some other group comes along, whether it's a you know homemade LLC that's created by citizens who want to see this thing develop, uh, or do people think it should be retained by the select board and managed by the select board uh, for the town indefinitely? Um, no, I, think I don't think anybody thinks that that it should be managed by the select board indefinitely. I don't even think the select board. I mean, since we're talking about tenant rentals, I, I've never felt that that was something they felt unless the they are well, actually use or occupy the building. But, but you know, in terms of the grants, the municipal funding mechanism is through the town. So mm -hmm. it seemed most reasonable that the town has at least the interim ownership while the upgrades are happening, while that money is happening. Yeah. Uh, and that certainly is not possible. That money is not available to the school district. Yeah, all I'm getting at is I think we need to come to a conclusion around what is the definition of the time frame, what are the parameters, and and be able to be public about it at some point. Otherwise, we're just kind of guessing and throwing out ideas. Uh, and I think that it won't instill confidence in the voters unless they have some sense of, you know, what are we really talking about? And uh, so that's an exercise we have yet to go through. Okay. Well, it is the exercise that we even have to do, like with the Brella application completion. And it's something I think Liz is trying to help, Liz Curry, the, the interim uh, project manager is trying to help us work on uh, is a schedule. Uh, even though, you know, <laughs> these things are not cast in stone because we're not, we're not in control of the availability of the contractors who have to do a certain thing. I mean, it just, this has been a, a, a difficult time for staffing, uh, what, whether that's across the agencies, but even for, for contract workers like consultants and so forth. So there's so many uncertainties in terms of scheduling. And I and you know, one of the things I need to applaud this committee on, and I do deeply from my heart, is your persistent support of the project and the activities that you're creating to you know, to, to uh, keep the high school heated and, and just everything that you've been doing is commendable. And uh, it, it takes that kind of perseverance of spirit and motivation to really move through. And I don't think any of us fully knew what we were getting into when we started. And look how far we come. And we have been told time and time again, you guys have really come a long way by every agency representative who has met with us and who has toured that building. And also, they say they love the proposal. Again, John Brooker, I love this proposal. You know, Eric Law from USDA, I love this proposal. Bernie well, Sanders, well, I love this proposal. So well, just, well, you well, know. Well, you hand up and then Sue. Okay. Um, I have a question for Representative White. Um, the legislature is talking about um, bringing in preschool from the ages of three and four years old. And I believe they're talking about a full day school program for three and four year olds. Um, if that were to come about, would the school system that we have, our district, where both of our elementary buildings are filled right up, um, if that becomes a mandate, would the school, the district now need that high school building for space? Uh, yeah, uh, and I haven't, yeah, the, that bill is still being manipulated and going through the legislative process. So, so I'm not really sure how that's going to, you know, unfold, whether or not it'll even, you know, get, get through the whole process. But, but I do think it's a fair question about, you know, um, for if you're, folding in you know different levels of child care then then you know what are the funding mechanisms and how do you support the, the facilities and and i suspect that there would probably be money attached to those pieces but but uh i know at this point certainly uh, you know appropriations and the way you know ways i mean they have they haven't they haven't got anywhere near looking at 
it at that, that level. So um, it, it is a fair question, um, you know, about that. But you know, there there are some uh, bills and things that are working through to to try to create more funding for towns, for example, don't have uh, any available space for uh, for childcare, and and to you know help them build childcare or, or develop childcare. Uh, properties so so that that might be a way that that would would could come back through to help support that because i think i don't think the, the legislature would just say oh here now take care of these kids now and uh you know good luck uh, so um but that's where, well, that's where what i've been getting from the school board is um you know <clears throat> a month ago they got very open to the idea of um daycare and um, they were actually ready to start those wheels turning right away of opening a daycare facility within the building. Uh, Jamie has said to me that just like everybody else, uh, he's interested in the auditorium section of the building. And then if we throw in these uh, three and four year olds, both Stockbridge and Rochester Elementary are at capacity. Um, they will need classrooms. Of course, that building is, would need to be retrofitted because the urinals are all too high for three-year-olds but uh, uh you know uh i i'm just wondering if if we look down the road and transfer the building the school might regret doing so if we look down the road a ways unless we upgrade the building and then we transfer it back to the the school district I mean, there's nothing that says we can't do that. And then the school district has the building that's been completely cleaned up and uh, the whole building envelope uh, upgraded for energy efficiency. Yeah, yeah they're not eligible for Bella unless they buy they're it. Not eligible for Bella. They're not eligible for the funding that we're talking about to clean up the building. Right. I mean, they need to. It's, it's sitting there as a school facility been used that way. So I don't think they would have to go through all of the hoops that we're going through because of transfer of ownership. Sue, did you have a question or a point a while back? Uh, uh, yeah, I was just uh, just building on what, what Dick was saying about the choice of uh, the town taking it or not. Um, yeah, of course, I, I don't think they're, they would vote to take on the building until we get they get more information like Pat was saying. Um, but that has to be then there should be a split screen and we could have all the information over here and then okay if you don't buy the building here's what's going to happen and here's what's not going to happen. Uh, the school is going to be stuck with uh, a building that's not fixed. <clears throat> try and sell and et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's, it really does need to be included in the information to the town. And the other thing is if it's going to be uh, potentially uh, used by the school system, again, the school system who, uh, who contracted with Black River Design back in 18 and 19, um, they learned about everything that needs to happen to upgrade this building. And, you know, it's almost 50 years old. So these systems need to be replaced, which is essentially what we're doing in our upgrades, replacing electric, replacing heat, replacing the roof, replacing the doors, replacing the windows. These are all things that have to be done to, as it goes into the future. So this is a viable asset that goes into the future. Kirk. I, and I, I just want to echo, uh, I think your, your, uh, instinct is is correct that you know uh, recognizing that you have to move at the pace that the that the citizen already feels comfortable moving at but but uh but you know i'm i'm on commerce and economic development that's my committee uh we we do put the money into the brownfield remediation programs and 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 all those kind of pieces that you're many of them that you're trying to access and utilize and right now there is a lot of money and there are a lot of uh you know municipalities that are are hankering for it so uh so you know the the uh now i'm pretty certain that this that this next budget year will also i mean you know there's of course there's the arpa you know money and arpa that you know related and and as as uh, 
was was stated, you know that that has to be um, you know, has to be allocated by about another year. But then there's a couple more years after that before it actually has to you know, projects uh, have to move forward. But but uh, but you know I'm pretty certain our committee is going to that, that we're there's still a strong move to keep putting money into that stuff at least for this next budgetary year. Uh, <clears throat> after that, you know the 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 uh, legislative economists and and a number of folks are are saying they expect a downturn in our economy and that that a lot of that stuff is probably going to get scarce. So uh, um, so just you know timing is important and uh, so I, I, will, I want to encourage you to to move <clears throat> as, at whatever the quickest pace you can. Uh, okay. I have a question to, for you too, in terms of when the when the state uh, with Act 46 uh, encouraged co consolidation. Certainly, they realized there was going to be the resultant empty buildings. Uh, was there any plan for you know how you would support the towns with their empty school buildings in the repurposing process? Because that was so integral to the decision to consolidate, and, and that that's before my tenure. Maybe maybe Sandy actually has some insight into that. Uh, Catherine, the answer is no. <laughs> there was no consideration, and 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 the reality is that that technically Act Forty Six did not say the schools had to consolidate. It said the school boards had to consolidate. So they they there was. There was a, um, um, I'm going to say a denial factor in the whole concept. Midge? Well, I'm just, if we have the need for a preschool and we have a need for a daycare, um, the town, the numbers are there between, especially with Rochester, but uh, with Rochester, but also especially with the two towns combined. Um, and both elementary schools are at their brim. Those kids are gonna be moving forward and going into middle school and high school, which the town is going to be paying tuition for. And this building, no matter who takes it on, um, certain aspects of the upgrades will have to be done. And so, if there is this discretion between what can be done when the school owns it or the district owns it and what can be done be, when via grants <clears throat> um, once the town takes over, doesn't it behoove us to just kind of strategize with the select board and our group and to and the school board to kind of dovetail those together so we take advantage of each one as much as we can because this work is going to have to be done even if the building gets turned over to somebody else um much of it will like the the environmental stuff but it seems to me like the towns move the both towns are moving towards the need to expand and if we demolish the school, if that's an option, then we don't have the option to utilize that space. But if we keep it and upgrade it, then we can turn it back to the town whenever that need arises. And apparently it's coming down the pike. Um, so does that make sense? <clears throat> um, anyway, that's my thought on it. Might be a good selling point. To, to really work together. What's that? It might be a good selling point to point out to the town, hey, we might need it in the future. Well, it seems like we need it kind of now. I mean, the preschool, the daycare was ready to move in at any moment. And now we're hearing that the, you know, the preschool is also, it may not happen this year with the preschool, but it sounds like that too is coming down the pike and there will need to be a space for that. And there is no space. So, you know, do you add on to the elementary school? <laughs> you know, how what's what are the options? Um, we have a building, we have a viable building. Yes, it's gonna cost less lot to upgrade, 
but um, it's a necessity. None of the town buildings have been, uh, there's never been a budget to maintain them to any real degree. And, you know, like the <laughs> infrastructure, we're kind of at a point where it needs to be tended to one way or the other. So I'd, I'd say take advantage of as many grants as we possibly can, at least make an attempt to take advantage of them. And if we wait on certain aspects, we'll, we'll lose that opportunity. Well, That's the, what we're being told about the money available now. What was the first part of what you said, Catherine? I said, that's what we're being told yeah. about the money available now, <clears throat> that it's unlikely it'll be available later. Well, maybe the, something? who was it? Burma. Oh, Burma, yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm just listening to everything. And if you want to have a vote about this with the citizens of the town of Rochester, you have to give them concrete things to consider. And from listening to this last hour or so of conversation, there's so many gray areas. I don't know how you can ask people to vote with so much uncertainty. So my bottom line is wondering, what is the taxpayer of Rochester being asked to give in order to have the building rescued and owned by the town. I, I think that needs to be spelled out very clearly. And maybe at, at the, um, the fall event, the harvest fair, there could be a poll taken amongst people who are voters of the town of Rochester, just to get an idea of where things stand. But I think much, much more concrete information needs to be given before people can really make an educated decision about this. So I'm just throwing that out there. That's only my opinion. I, I appreciate that, Burma. That it's a very logical opinion. <laughs> people need to know. And we're working, we're working to get that information. Yep. Yeah. So it's going to take more time. And uh, we're, as, as Catherine said a little while ago, as, you know, we, we overcome a few hurdles, we discover a few more. So it's taken longer than anybody really thought that would. Um, so but my sense, I just want to get a sense, the, my sense is that we need to keep working away at this environmental stuff. Don't shortchange in terms of getting the information. But at the same time, we can be pursuing uh, or at least learning about the various funding streams. And uh, we wanna retain uh, either Liz or someone, Liz Curry or someone who's in a position to help us with uh, seeking uh, grant funds, uh, use some of our seed money to do that. Um, are we ready to move on to the last item? I wanna, on the one, so I, we, we did have a conversation with Erica Hoffman Kais about the possibility of, of them taking the building on an interim basis during the upgrade process. Um, we never got a definitive answer. She was gonna get back to us on that. She was in Africa at the time. Uh, and she did encourage us to apply to be one of the top 10 projects. I don't even know what the result of that is, but um, we're, we're pursuing a lot of different possibilities with this whole thing i i just want people to know that you know we're not you know every single possibility that we can chase down to see whether it's viable that will 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 help in the process of achieving the goal and the immediate goal right now is to get the funding together to upgrade that building Okay, last item on the agenda is uh, prep for the <clears throat> town meeting on uh, March the 6th. I'm, I'm assuming Catherine and I will do a tag team again like we did last year, give a briefing on where things stand and take questions. Um, 
anybody else wants to participate in that, <laughs> raise your hand. But uh, come to the meeting, listen and hear, uh, and you know, hopefully answer questions if you can. Catherine, anything else you want to add tonight? Well, I don't think we can take an hour out of the town meeting uh, for for all this. I think we really do have to organize a pretty concise uh, presentation yes. uh, while giving people what they need to, to have to ask questions. Yep. Yep. Sue and Robert. Um, there, there could be a table out in the, the lobby. In the lobby with some information that would be more than the speech that you're going to be able to make. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need all the opportunities to um, educate people. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. And remember, um, I already got my my uh, town meeting book. Um, so I can remind you there's three pages of information <laughs> in the book. Yes. <laughs> for the high school so you do have it covered on on where where you've been yeah i think we would hit, hit the heights um have a hand out and ask for questions <laughs> Skip the load. robert that's right pat thanks for reminding us that, you know i don't know how that was gonna end up in the report because it was that's a larger than an eight and a half by 11 so it takes up three pages three pages <laughs> robert yeah. Yeah, just a logistical detail. Um, normally, either myself or Gemma would take care of the um, sound and lights and such for the town meeting. I will be out of the state, and obviously mm -hmm. Gemma is no longer available. Yeah. So I'll have to arrange with someone to um, just show them how I, I can arrange. I can set up everything, but so that someone can come in and turn it on, but. Mm -hmm. I will not what be about there. Ben? What about Ben? Who? His name is Ben. Ben Janet. No, I wouldn't, wouldn't suggest that. Mm. What yeah. about Ethan? Ethan might be able to do it. Is he mo is he a moderator? Ethan? No, it's usually Dan McKinley. Okay, it's Dan. Okay. All right. I think okay. we're about done with our agenda. Any other Questions, comments, Pat? I submitted the newspaper notice this afternoon. It may not make it into this week's paper because it's Wednesday afternoon, but uh, it will definitely be in next week's paper. So the umbrella application will oh, follow that and boom, we're, we got on it this afternoon. And thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right. Uh, we'll meet again probably monthly, and uh, they need to be and will be open meetings. And uh, you know, presumably, we'll get more participation from the public as as we go along. And uh, that's it for tonight. Good night. Well, Good night. Night. anybody who needs, Thank you. who needs more committee members for these activities, let us know. Uh, the heat related activities. Does anybody know if there's any? Uh, money uh banked already towards the heat is there yeah. a total oh yes i wanted i wanted to say that mm -hmm. uh we raised ten thousand five hundred thirty five dollars um by the end of 2022 uh there's going to be some expenses from that take in, taken out you know so i can't tell you what the net is but i don't think there's been a lot of of expenses so uh, we're halfway to our commitment in, as the one third of the task, but then we also learned that we haven't used as much heat as they projected. So th they're not expecting the heat cost to be as high as they thought it would be in September. Okay, great. The end on a high note. Yes. <laughs> Representative White, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Yes. Okay.